So, I know Pastor just prayed, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray again, okay? <laughs> it's just my custom, I'm sorry. So, if you bow your heads with me real quick. Father, I just thank you so much, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord Jesus. Lord, I, I thank you, Father God, for just making us all vessels for you, Lord. I thank you, Father, that, Lord, that, that we are your instruments, Father God. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just share this word, Father God, that you've given me, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Father, that, that if there would be anything that is of me, I pray that you just block it from their ears, Lord. And that you, Holy Spirit, would have your perfect way and your perfect will, Father God, for the, for the folks here today, Lord. And Father, we just, I just submit to you. Just submit to you, Lord. Just have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Oh, man. Don't you guys love emotion? I mean, God, our God created emotion. Wow. And as we were just seeing that song, and Pastor asked us to, you know, sing it again, I just, I just felt like, you know, God just come down and just, you know, all the emotions that come with love and, and just his joy and his peace, and it just overwhelms me and it overwhelms the, the congregation and it overwhelms you guys. And, you know, I just, I just remember that God created motion. I remember one time my, my cousin asked me, you know, what's so fun about heaven? And I said, you know, the Lord created heaven. The Lord created joy. The Lord created peace. The Lord created love. Even a smile, the smile you have on your face, God created that. So, so our God, He loves emotion. He is a God that shows emotion, and He gives and He gives it freely. So, so just just take that in consideration uh, as I as I as I go about uh, uh, this word that God's given me. So. Um, as you know, um, and you guys know me, so I, I've been I've been really kind of almost undecisive on what I was going to share today uh, throughout this whole week. Ever since Pastor said I was going to uh, uh, teach today, about like two or three weeks ago, I just kept on. I, I thought I had it down, and I just like you know, God kept on giving me these words, and uh, I was like, okay, yes, I've got it. And I, I told Leo, I was like, yes, I got it. I'm going to teach on this, and then. Last night, man, I tell you, it's a 180, man, 180. Oh my goodness! But uh, God, God is still good, man. He is faithful to deliver His word. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I was going to, because it uh, talk about. But uh, t today, I'm switching it around a little bit, uh, which is it's still linked to what I was going to talk about. Uh, it's confusing. But the title of the, the title of this sermon today is going to be. Um, Pursuing courage to stand. Or you just call it standing. So I was looking, when, when Pastor first gave it to me, I was, I was thinking about uh, something I shared with the men's group a while back in Joshua chapter 10. And that's where uh, Joshua is faced with uh, fighting five kings that uh, were threatening Israel. During the time Israel had, we give you a little setting. During the time Israel had just taken over Jericho, and they had just defeated an enemy that had killed, uh, that, that had defeated them prior to. And in, in verse uh, uh, 24 and 25, they've caught these kings, okay, and, and and they bring them out because they've been hiding in a cave. So they bring them out, and this is what Joshua says. It says, when they brought out those kings to Joshua. He called for all the, all the Israelites and told the commanders of the men of war who went with him, come put your feet on the necks of these kings. All right? Kind of stand, stand on their necks, okay? That's, that's a pretty rude thing to do, all right? <laughs> but that's the enemy. And I, I thought, I thought, I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to give a word about, you know, defeating the enemy, being victorious, standing on their necks, and, and, and just, you know, just telling them, you know what, you guys are good for nothing, and try to, you know, defeat me, but we, we stand on their necks, and after that, Joshua says, he kills them, you know, and it said, I'll finish this out, it says, and they came and put their feet on the king's necks, Joshua said to them, fear not, uh, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage, for thus says the Lord, do not do, uh, thus says, for thus shall the Lord do, to all your enemies against whom you fight. 
So, so God is saying here, all your enemies, anybody who goes against you, anybody who's against you, God will put them down, prostrate on the floor, and your feet, you will stand on their necks. Okay, so I was, I was going to just talk about standing, okay? That's what I, was, I thought I was going to talk about. But as, 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 as I was thinking about this, I rem, I'm, I'm reminded that Joshua, because actually throughout the whole book of Joshua, God continually reminds Joshua and the Israelites. He says, uh, from the very first chapter, I'll read it to you. It says in chapter 1, verse 5, it says, it tells, God tells Joshua, uh, and you guys can turn there if you want to, but I'm just going to say on these two briefly. Uh, it says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. I have not commanded you, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So, this actually is not the only time God reminds Joshua, okay? He reminds him in chapter 7 again, and he continually reminds him in Israel throughout the whole chapter. Because, because courage, being strong, is not something you just remember to do. You know, because I, I was thinking about that. I, I could have just gave a message about standing on God and this is what you have to do to stand against your enemy. This is what you do to, to overcome. But uh, I have to understand how they receive that courage, how they receive that strength. And, and then the Holy Spirit just kept on just stirring in my heart saying, you know, how is this possible? Because courage, can, courage and strength cannot be uh, some cannot be learned. I mean, it can be learned, but it's not something that you just do. Like, I work out with Brother Luis all the time on Wednesdays. If, if I, he came to me and just said, you know, okay, start squatting 300 pounds. I'm like, no way, man. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to squat that. But it, 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 it's something you live out. Courage and strength is something you live out. It's not, it's not like I'm taking an exam and it's the, the question is, so what did I do when troubles come my way? What do I do when the giants come and fa at my, face me at my door? Oh yeah, I remember. I just gotta have courage and strength. Let's go. Let's do this. But but it's 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 more easily said than done. And it's it is not an answer to an equation. It is not an answer that is to be taken lightly. But it is character that God has given in us and developed in us that we must cultivate. We must cultivate. So. Instead of preaching on Joshua chapter 10, this is the whole intro, uh, we, let's look back at cha uh, Joshua chapter 7. Because there's something here that we have to be reminded of. So we're going to look at Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. So right now, Joshua and them had just defeated Jericho. That's the, that's the awesome story about how, you know, the Lord told them to walk around uh, Jericho seven times, I think seven times, <laughs> and then shout. And then after they gave a great shout, all the walls broke, tumbled down, and then they took the city. All right? Just like how we're going to take Madison. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, and I'm, I'm laughing for joy, okay? That was a laugh of joy. Praise the Lord. Um, but... And then so, so they, had, they had made a promise to God to consecrate everything that they find in the, in the city, like gold, silver, all the precious things to God. So they, they made that vow. So we, let's start our story here. It says, uh, right away. <laughs> but the Israelites committed a trespass in regards to the devoted things. For Achan, son of Carmea, the son of Zebedee, the son of Zaire, of the tribe of Judah took some of the things devoted um, to, to, for destruction. Okay, I have the amplified here. And uh, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. All right, so right away we see that Israel didn't do what they were supposed to, which is fine because, you know, Israel's the only group of people that don't do what they're supposed to. I mean, we, we are perfect, right? Okay, <laughs> so go, going on, it says, Joshua sent men from Jericho 
to Ai, which is near uh, Bethlehem, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to them, let not all men, let not all the men go up, but let about 2,000 or 3,000 go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole army toil up there, for they saw, for they of Ai are few. So about 3,000 Israelites went up there, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of them. That's a pretty good number, you know, out of 3,000. Okay, uh, for, for they chased them from uh, chased them from before the gates as far as Shirmeth and slew them at the at the descent and the hearts of the people melted and became as water so they had 3,000 guys two to 3,000 guys go up and only 36 of them died I think those that's a pretty good number man I mean that's not that's not too many people that died but even even though that small amount of number is still death but uh, it says here, and their hearts, and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So right after uh, they had, they conquered this big city, this the city like Jericho. Let's just call it like uh, you know, like a big city like Shanghai, you know, or something like that, or, or probably New York. But New York is like smaller, so like 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 a really big city, but fortified, you know, with walls and. You know, and then the Israelites, all they had was swords, you know, and how can they break through the wall? So they, they conquered this behemoth of a city. And then so they go out and they spy and they see this little city and they say, oh, you know what? It's, it's not going to take the whole army. It's going to just take about, you know, 3,000. And they, they go out and they fight them. And they get 30, 36 out of 3,000 dying. And then their heart turns into water. Everything that they remember in their past Everything, which was probably just like a week or two ago, I guess, <laughs> that they just conquered Jericho, they just, they just, they just melted back. It became water. And Joshua rent his clothes, verse six, and laid on the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua, Joshua said, "Alas, O Lord." Why have you brought this people over to Jordan, to over the Jordan at all, only to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we be content to dwell beyond the Jordan? O oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has turned to uh, turn to flee before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth and what will you do for your great name okay let's stop there for a little bit so Joshua he begins to just fall prostrate on his face and say Lord why why didn't you just let us stay where we were at we already have that land but you want us to go fight more and take over this land but then you cause us to lose and now I feel like everybody around me, because we have to remember Israel had just escaped out of Egypt. They're just refugees. They're not a nation already. They're just still refugees. And they come into this land to take uh, their land back, basically, because God promised for them. Okay, and, they, uh, and, and, and where they are at, even today, to this day, Israel surrounded by their enemies. And I think that's how it's always going to be like, because even that, even during this day, all the people, all the kings around them, are surrounding him and they don't like him because they know that he they said that they're gonna go and take over the land so they're gonna go in and, and Joshua brings up this good point Lord we were just happy over here but now you want us to go over here and you want us to fight but you make us lose and now all our enemies who surround us they're gonna kill us they're gonna wipe us out and when they wipe us out Lord but we'll, we'll talk more about that because Joshua makes a great point here. But what he does is amazing. What he does is amazing. Because he doesn't, uh, he complains, okay, I wouldn't call it complaining. Uh, I would call it 
he makes a good argument. He makes a good appeal to an all-powerful God. Okay, okay. You just don't. You just don't come into, uh, you know, Washington D.C. at the White House and go to President Obama. Hey, Obama. You know what? I don't like what you're doing here. Just walk up and then you know pat him on the back. There's because there's about you know there's Secret Service agents around you, and as soon as you come in, they'll surprise snipe you or something. But uh, but in the same sense, you you just you have to honor. Joshua's honoring God in this. But he does it in a way that is completely uh, different from what the world will do, okay? And what he, got, what he does with the character that he shows here is humility. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Whoa, it took a lot. Okay, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Because courage, the courage to stand, pursuing the courage to stand, it's a process. All right. God has made a process for us to get saved. God has made a process for us to do many things in our lives. And, and one of the things to obtain courage is we have to obtain, we have to first acquire humility. And this is what Joshua does. Because the world would say, we just conquered one of the greatest nations near us with the you know fortified city. You know, so what if we lose 36 people? Let's just keep going. Let's just send more troops in. But Joshua knew right away. Joshua knew right away to go to where his source of power was. He knew exactly what to do. So, so what is humility? Um, you know, I could look up a definition of it. But uh, I'm just going to go with what I was taught a while back. Humility. Humility is seeing yourself for who you really are. It's, it's, it's the revealing of all your flaws and all your shortcomings. But just not that. It's everything that's good about you and everything that's bad about you. Just being truthful. So, one, one thing about humility that, that, that we as human beings almost always hate, always, always, like, this is the last thing we'll ever do, is be vulnerable. Being vulnerable is, is key for courage. I was taught one time, and I believe this, that it's more courageous for someone to reveal their weakness. It's more courageous for someone to admit uh, the shortcomings. But, <laughs> I say but, uh, there's an important thing that we have to look here. Because Paul says, this is a biblical form of humility. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, you guys can turn there if you guys want. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 6 through 10. I'll go and read that here. It says, uh, It says, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It says, if I want to boast, kind of proud, if I want to boast, I would be no, I would be no fool in doing so. Because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it. Because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time that he says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So this biblical view, this is what Paul says here is, 
almost completely different for what the world would see, would say, and do. Christians, God has called us to a higher standard. God has called us to a higher standard. And we are not to do what the world does, but we are to do what Christ does. We'll, we'll get more into that. But, but this, this thing of humility, this characteristic, this character of God, this godly character, is not only meant for us to be broken, okay? It's not only meant for us to throw ash, you know, on our head and lay prostrate and face down on the ground and ask God, you know. Because the thing is, it's, 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 it's not about, God does not have any sex, satisfaction when you say, it's my fault, you know. Or it's, it's, he has no satisfaction in that, all right? But what he wants, what he wants is for you to get in his presence. And that's what humility does. That's what it does. It's not about admitting you're wrong or anything. It, it has a way about that, but you have to be truthful about yourself. But what it does ultimately is it gets you in a place where you're in his presence. I want you guys to turn to Psalms 34, 18. I'm going to just read these scriptures out really fast, but that's the one that will probably bring out what I'm going to say. Sorry. So Psalms, Psalms uh, 34 and 18 says this. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Psalms 140, uh, 147 verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted. And manages their wounds. So that's another aspect of humility that God wants us to do. All right, it's not for you to feel bad about yourself. All right, that's actually false humility. That's actually false humility when you just you know throw a pity party. All right, I know for that. I know that. <laughs> Father, forgive me. But the thing is, the thing is that we have to go past that because it's admitting that we are wrong. But knowing that in this time that we're wrong, we can go in His presence. Because we, if we stop where we are just broken, we never get healed. Because in His presence, we get healed. And we, and we see this in uh, Peter. Uh, you guys can write this down if you're taking notes. 1 Peter 5, 6, James chapter 4, verse 10, Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. And I'll, I'll read those real quick. It says, in 1 Peter, it says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time He will lift you up in honor. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up in honor. That's James chapter 4, 10. They kind of repeat themselves. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So what is humility? Uh, it says, let me see what I wrote here. So true humility, <laughs> so true humility gives us strength to be broken and face the truth about ourselves, and where our, and it gives us re reference, and it gives us the only reference of where our strength lies, which is in Christ Jesus. An, an interesting verse that. Um, if you guys can turn to, and then we'll, we'll go on to another thing. But interesting verse that, that I, I pulled out, and I was discussing this with my brother Dion the other night. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 44. The verses might be, might be a little different here, but the one I'm going to read uh, is going to comply to what uh, I want to emphasize here. So it says, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him into powder. Could the rock here is Jesus, or the stone here is Jesus. You can either choose to fall on the rock and be broken, or the rock can fall on you. You'll be broken, but you'll be grinded into powder. All right? But what's interesting about this is that um, the people who fall on the rock are broken. The people the, the rock fall upon, they're broken too. Isn't that interesting? Because this is a description of humility. 
can either choose to be humble or you can be humbled. But, you, but, but, the, but the cool thing about that is that we need, to be, we need a desire to be humble. We desire to be uh, humbled because when we are humble, we're in His presence. Because those pieces that are broken, whether you choose to fall on it or whether the rock falls on you, God picks up and He makes them new. All right, that's what he desires to do. Even when he embraces the cross, uh, how many see the passion? All right, even 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 when he's walking, you know, his his mother, you know, Mary comes and then uh, starts crying, and man, it's a very touching point in the movie. And then and then he looks at his mother and he says, "I am making all things new." And then he's describing what's going to happen to him as he carries the cross, as he's going to be broken. All right? So I'm not asking you to physically break yourself, okay? I'm asking you, in a spiritual sense, in your inward person, in your heart, be broken. I think even in James it says, you know, turn your joy into crying. You know, turn your laughter into crying and, and, and humble yourself before the Lord so he can exalt you. All right? Because in, in that place of brokenness is where we find our strength to face everything that is going against us. And, and in his presence, his presence he brings healing. In his presence, it's joy, it says in Psalms. So, so what does that have to do with courage? I mean, definitely humility gives us strength. But what, what's cool here is that, let's, let's look at it back at Joshua uh, chapter 7, okay? I'm going to read uh, again here, so just to emphasize. So as we're going to study how Joshua makes his appeal, okay? In verse 7, verse 7. Seven, got, seven is God's perfect number. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all, at, at all only to give us to the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say now? That Israel has turned to flee before their enemies. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do with your great name? You see, there's one thing to come to God. And say, I blew it. Or say, I have character flaws. Or say, you know, I, I just don't cut it. But what Joshua states here, he humbles himself, yes. But what he says here takes a lot more. Because it, 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 he talks as if a man would talk to God in a regular conversation. Okay? He, he talks and to God as if he were just uh, like like me and Pastor Bob we have a meeting well uh, okay like yeah like me and Pastor Bob we were just talking you know and I asked Pastor Bob a question or Pastor Bob asked me a question you know so 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 you just don't do that to God you know but but he comes in boldness and boldness is the key here he comes in boldness and says not about his character because Joshua's character is nothing all right, his character—he's—he's he's a sinner. We are all—we're we're all sinners. But what—what what he appeals to is God's character. All right, for your namesake, what will people say about your name? He makes an appeal to God's character because we know God; His character is flawless. He always does what He says. He never ever gives up. He never fails. And if you believe he fails, Satan's got you on something, and we're going to pray for you to get that out. Okay? Because he never fails, man. God is always there. I know that in my life. I know many people here that have known that in their life. That God never gives up on any one of you. So he, God, he makes this appeal to God's character or God's righteousness. Okay? Boldly. Boldly. So... It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 
Because, because another, another way to describe righteousness is boldness. You're probably asking me why, how does that describe boldness? So, in Proverbs chapter, uh, I'll throw verses out here like that. I'm sorry. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, it says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as lions. <laughs> so, what does righteous mean? The, the Bible says, For I tell you, in Matthew 5, 20, it says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, okay, so how does that all apply? Okay, I'm going to explain that. <laughs> so, righteousness, I mean, even, even as I, I, I think upon righteousness, like what can you, how can you describe righteousness? What does it do? I, I just said it was, it was boldness, okay? But, but how, do you des how do you describe righteousness? Righteousness. How do you do? How do you obtain righteousness? How do you uh, grab? How do, how do you you know form righteousness in your head? You can't you can't really define righteousness other than you know a dictionary. But but you know as I, you know as I was dwelling on that thought, I was thinking about that. Uh, it's easier. It's easier than you think because sometimes we like to complicate complicate things. We like to just make things that are so simple, very hard to understand. Uh, but, man, I'm telling you, the great teacher, man, the Holy Spirit, he makes things easy. So, so, so don't, you know, you're going to commentaries and stuff, go ahead and use those. But the great teacher, man, the Bible even said that, man. He said he'll bring to remembrance all the things that are written in the Word. So, I mean, trust the great teacher before you trust your commentary, okay? <laughs> but, uh, anyway. And, and trust him before you trust what I'm going to say. You know, look this up and uh, ask ask the Holy Spirit. Don't believe what I just say. But uh, so the Holy Spirit laid this on my heart. So righteousness is basically what it means: right standing with God. Right standing with God. That means I can just sit down and talk to God because, hey man, you and me are okay. We're right. That's why, you know, Pastor always says, you know, get right with God. Get right with God and you have a relationship with Him. Because then you can actually just go down and sit down and talk to Him, just like Joshua is right now. I'm not sure if Joshua's sitting down, he's probably still on his face when he says it. But, <laughs> but, but what it means in that, in, that, in that sense is to be right with God, in right standing with God, to be blameless. All right? I got nothing, God has no offense against me. And we all understand. If you don't understand already, the only way we, the Bible says our righteousness is but filthy rags. Everything we try to do to get right with God is filthy rags. But his righteousness, his righteousness is what we need. Because it says in, in 2 Corinthians, that's where I was going to go, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we are now right made righteous. Not because of our righteousness, because they're filthy rags, because of his righteousness, because of his character. Yeah. Right? So when God sees us, we are blameless. So Joshua in chapter 7, even though he Christ has not died yet, but we've got to remember God is outside of time. And then the Bible says that the people before Christ were believing in Christ to come ahead of time, and he would they have been made righteous through that belief. Okay? That's why, that's why Jesus tells Thomas, blessed are those who, uh, who have not seen and believe, okay? So we, I mean, we don't see, we haven't seen, but we believe, but it has happened. He was raised from dead, and we're, we're redeemed. So, so that is our righteousness. So what can we sum righteousness up to? Yes, it's part boldness. That's why the Bible says, you know, the righteous are as bold as lions. Even Hebrew says, uh, let me look it up here. Even Hebrew says, so uh, in ver uh, chapter 4, verse 14 through 16, it says, So then, since we have a great high priest, just kind of like what we we're talking about, who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he has faced all the same tests we do. Yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly, that's word again, to the throne of 
of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. We will find grace to help us when we need it most. Oh, amen. It's about humility. But it's not only about humility. It's also about righteousness. It's about, it's about believing. See, because I'm going to give you a whole bunch of quick verses here that are very powerful. Uh, as I was growing in, in the Lord, uh, I found all these verses, and I, I, it's like treasures. It's like treasures. I know, I know, like a lot of you guys, when you first met the Lord, you guys had the Bible out, and you guys would highlight. I see Pastor Bob, so the Bible. He highlighted, like, man, this whole book is highlighted. But they're really good stuff, though. But, but I'm saying, they're like treasures. These are like treasures to me. When I read this, because it, it says in Habakkuk, Chapter 2, verse 4, it says, See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not, uh, are not upright, but the righteous person will live by faith. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For the gospel, uh, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, the, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to last, just as written, the righteous will live by faith. And in Galatians 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 11, clearly no one who relies on on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. I mean, yeah, chapter 10, verse 38. My righteous, my righteous one will live by faith and take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. So it's pretty clear here. It's pretty clear here throughout the Bible that what righteousness stands for is not what you can do. It's, not, it's never what you can do. All right? We know that from Isaiah. It's what you believe in. It's what God has called you to believe in. And so Joshua comes. Let me give you one more statement to emphasize that, okay? Before we go to Joshua. So even, even in John chapter uh, uh, 6, verse 29, it says that... Uh, okay. It says... That the only work required from us, the only work, because this is right after uh, the people say, you know, if God's going to do everything for me, because if Jesus kind of says, oh, don't worry, don't work for the food that, that, that uh, you know, goes away, you know, but work for the food and money that lasts forever. And then so then the people said, OK, God, so you don't want us to work. So what do you want? What do you want? What is our work? What are we supposed to do? And then Jesus replies and says, the only work that is required from you is to believe the one uh, that God has sent. So our job is to believe in Jesus. That is our righteousness. That is what our righteousness is. And it takes, it takes humility to get to that point. It takes humility to, to, to be able to, to look at your Talents and say, Lord, I know you're not looking for talent. Lord, I know that you are not looking for special gifts because you're the one that gave me the gift anyway. You know, you're not looking for something special. All you're looking for is a person that is willing to believe. So let's look at Joshua. The, the main thing here, he makes an appeal. He humbles himself. He gets in God's presence. He gets healed up. He gets strengthened. And then he makes an appeal to God's character with boldness. Standing upon no righteousness of his own. But he stands upon only God's righteousness. His righteous character. And you know what God did? Let's just see. Verse 13. Okay, I got too many papers up here. Verse 13 says... Uh, oh no, actually, let me just read the rest of it. Okay. Uh, okay. And what will you do for your great name? The, then the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why do you lie upon, uh, lie, lie thus upon your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant, which I have commanded them. They have taken some of the things devoted for destruction. They have stolen and lied and lied and put them amongst their own baggage. That is why the Israelites could not stand before their enemies, but fled before them. They are accursed and have been devoted for destruction. I will cease to be with you unless you destroy the accursed, devoted things among you. 
Okay, so God just kind of tells him what's, what's the problem. Okay. Praise the Lord, we're under grace. So nobody's going to die. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, thing, the, thing, the thing is here, I want to I wanna, I wanna show and I want to bring out is, 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 is God's character. He is always faithful to answer. If you want to hear what he wants to say, of course. You have, to, you have to be willing to hear what he wants to say. And everything he does is motivated by love. And so since everything that he does is motivated by love for us, he, died, he desires the same from us. He desires the same from us. That, our, that what we give him, that what we do, is motivated by love. And love is a great motivator. It's, 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 it's what may, causes us to desire the things of God. All right? I don't know about you, but I remember the first time I met, I, I mean, I was a Christian when growing up. But I didn't really know the love of God. I just knew that He died for me. But when when I went to college and I and I met with this group, and to that night, uh, I didn't know what they were going to do. But they were just playing songs to the Lord and they were reading scriptures about God's love and he, His emotions for us and how He longs for us. And I remember they were reading out of Romans chapter five, verse eight. It says, "But while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you." And, 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 and uh, something happened. Something clicked in my heart where, where I, I, I realized, hey, man, this guy is for real. God is for real. He loves me. And uh, these people begin to cry as they sing. Man, and it, it was just powerful. And I'm telling you, God is a God of emotion. That's why I said that the first time. God is a God of emotion. He desires for you to express it to him, and he desires to express it to you, too. All right. So I don't I don't know about you guys, but uh, don't get don't get caught up with uh, just being you know like stone soldiers as you as you're in church. Express yourself because he wants to express himself to you. How can somebody express themselves to you unless you express yourself to them? So would you would, would you, I mean even this whole week would you just find something to do for God? Express yourself to him because he is living. He is he is active just like his word did. <laughs> Um, so I say all that to say this. Um, I'll give you one more uh, scripture here. Oh, actually three more. And then we'll, we'll close. Okay, four, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so it says, <laughs> look at all my notes. Um, that's, why, that's why I couldn't decide. Okay, but I have to read this one. Okay, I have to read this one because Jesus is the ultimate in displaying humility and courage. Okay. Because he came down to earth not knowing uh, if these people will accept him, okay? I mean, you think, I mean, you think God knows already, you know? You think that God already, like, okay, I already know, like, Leo's going to go to heaven. Uh, Angel's going to go to heaven because I, I wrote them in the book of life, man. You know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You don't even worry about tomorrow because I already got But that's not how it works, man. It's a relationship. Because God desires your heart. But you know what? He understands this, though. He doesn't. He knows that we are we are weak. We're not able to do everything. You know that's why he does it for us. But the thing is that he trusts in his character, okay? And he believes that love never fails. All right. That's why we have that chapter. It says, uh, "Oh man, okay." It says, uh, "And now these oh not that one. Love never gives up. Never loses faith. It always." It's always hopeful. It endures through every every circumstances. Love never fails. First Corinthians chapter thirteen verse seven. So so he believes in that. So even if things don't go his way, he still believes that they're going to be made new. Just like how when you're broken, he desires to make that new. But um, that which leads to uh, Philippians chapter two verse. Uh, 5 through 11. I know I'm giving a lot of scriptures today. It says, actually, let's turn there. I'll wait for you guys to turn there. It's, this is worth turning to. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 5 through 11. It 
So humility is, a, is sometimes considered a contrast to courage in the world's eyes, but in reality is not. And our great Savior, Jesus, ultimately became a servant and he died. So it says here in Philippians chapter 2, uh, chapter, uh, verses 5 to 11, Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count any quality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, Marie realized this, but emptied himself, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being form, found in a human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And here comes what God does. This is what God always does, not just for Jesus, but for everybody, because we're, we're co-heirs. It says, therefore God has highly exalted him because he humbled himself, because he emptied himself. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to God, the glory of the Father. Okay, to the glory of God the Father. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. But so we see Joshua here. Go back to Joshua. He makes this appeal to God in humility, but also in righteousness. Not his righteousness, but uh, God's righteousness. And I look at myself. I look at all the people around the world. We're weak. We're completely weak. We're really frail, you know. We're, we're, easily, we're easily hurt. Just by not looking at somebody, not saying hi to somebody, we're easily broken, easily, easily, easily. But we, 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 we harden ourselves up and we refuse to receive help from the Lord. So what, I, what I'm saying is, don't put up fronts. <laughs> but God is calling us to be broken. God is calling us to be in His presence. I'm going to go one more scripture, okay, guys? And then we're going to close. Sorry. Uh, I'm not going to apologize. Actually, I'm going to take that back. First uh, Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. It says, Now these three remain. These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Christians, we should aim for love. But never let ourselves fall past hope. Because hope says, well, probably might not happen. Maybe one in a million years it might happen, but maybe, just, just maybe, but I, I don't think so, but it might. That's what hope says. Faith says this. Faith says, I believe it's going to happen. I'm claiming it. That's mine. What love says is this. It's already mine. I've got it no matter what. And then even if things don't go my way, it's still mine. Because God says this when he came down. You are mine. You've always been mine. I've created you. I knew you before you were born. And I love you. So would you bow your heads with me real quick? As God has spoken to you, as the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, let us not fall past hope, but let us aim for love. Because love is the great encourager. Love is the great motivator. Love is what makes us wake up in the morning. In His Word, for God so loved the world that He gave. He, God, even God is motivated by love. Father, we just thank you so much for this day. 
We thank you, Father God, that our strength comes from you and your righteousness. But above all else, Lord, that our strength comes from your love. That you've chosen to love us. Lord, you became sin who knew no sin that we could be your righteousness. Father, we just, we just submit to you now, Lord. I'm just going to open up the altars. I'm going to pray a prayer. You can follow me if you want to. But I want to open up the altars. If you need to get right with the Lord, go ahead. If you want God to increase your love, go ahead. Come on, the altars are open. Feel free to do so. Go hard in your hearts. God is good. Father, I know that I'm not right. Father, I know all the shortcomings I have, all my flaws, but yet you still love me. Lord, I know I messed up yesterday, but I know you still love me. Lord, I know I was your enemy, but you still love me. And God, today, I want to make a stand. And I want to say, your love has won me over. Lord, you can have all of me because you gave all yourself to me already. And Jesus, would you come into my heart and be Lord of my life? Not just Savior, but truly Lord of my life. And God, I know it's going to be hard, but Lord, I thank you that you're going to be next to me, that you're going to watch me through this, just as you did Joshua and the Israelites. Lord, I know I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm, gonna, and I'm even going to be, I'm, I'm even going to feel terrible about them. But Lord, if you, if you're always there with me, I, I, I will trust in you, God. And Holy Spirit, teach me how to go about this walk. Holy Spirit, remind me what I need to do when I mess up. Remind me that my strength comes from you and you alone, Jesus. And Father, we just give you all the praise today. Lord, I pray that Holy Spirit, that you would just continually be with the congregation. Lord, I pray that you would just speak to their hearts even after the message. Lord, I, I thank you, Father God, that, that your word never returns void, Father God. But Lord, as, as we were just speaking here, Lord, it will accomplish its perfect will in each one's lives today, Lord Jesus. It will go unchanged, Father God. Lord, but you will change us with your word. So Lord, we just give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The altars are open and um, just feel if you feel led. Be up here to pray for you if you want. And we'll just end with a chorus here.